Hi, everyone. Welcome to Wise Folks Almanac. And today we have Jeremy Dill with us. Hi, Jeremy. How are you today? Hello. Great to be here with you guys. Yeah, very nice to have you, Jeremy. So before we uh, hit our first question to Jeremy, I'd like to introduce all of the audiences to Jeremy. And as always, we prepare some notes, um, which I'm going to read it out. Jeremy Dill is the founder and portfolio manager at JDP Capital Management. JDP Capital Management is a hedge fund for like-minded investors to own stakes in a handful of deeply researched businesses with a unique value proposition and a multi-year growth runway. Prior to founding JDP Capital, Jeremy had built multiple successful businesses for a decade. He started his career at Honeywell International. Jeremy later joined Secure Wireless Inc. as a startup. An avid follower of Warren and Charlie, Jeremy researches what makes businesses not only survive, but thrive and reinvest capital at a sustainable high rate of return. So, Jeremy, here goes my uh, first question to you. You have been in the investment management business for more than a decade now. Uh, could you give us a little background on how your journey as an investor has evolved throughout these years? And also for the young audiences listening to the show, what does it take to develop the core characteristics of a successful investor? Sure. So when, when I started, um, it was coming out of the financial crisis. Um, and there were so many companies that were trading statistically cheap. There were companies, I mean, banks, for example, were trading for small banks. You could screen for small banks trading for, you know, you know 20% of book value or 10% of book value. There were so many smaller companies trading for, you know, just over the cash on the balance sheet, for example. And so we started out looking at businesses and investing in smaller businesses that just statistically were, were cheap. They just looked cheap. They looked like, wow, I can't believe it's only four times EBITDA or three times EBITDA. And there wasn't too much more work put into it other than just trying to understand the business and maybe have us some kind of an educated opinion um, on it. But really the, the foundation was, wow, this, this company is statistically cheap. And what happened was as we came out of the um, as we came out of the Great Recession and, and you know, later in 2011, um, when we launched, um, it, it took some time for, for all the, you know, for these cheaper companies to catch up. But ultimately they did. And as they re-rated and became somewhat fairly valued, you know, the idea was, OK, we need to sell them and we need to recycle that capital and look for more things. And. In the beginning, you know, it seemed like, you know, there's this idea that you can just always be on this hunt um, and that you can always find, you know, some little gym out there that nobody understands or that everybody has overlooked because it doesn't have a lot of research coverage or it's just so small. But what we learned over over doing this for a while was that, you know, most of the time, unless you're coming out of a financial crisis like you know, the great financial crisis or something like that. Most of the time, companies are cheap for a reason. Most of the time, companies, um, businesses trade roughly wh what they're worth, you know, give or take some, uh, you know, they, 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 the market is not as dumb as maybe I thought um, more than a decade ago. Um, and it's funny because even when we look back at some of those really cheap businesses, the smaller cap companies I invested in, in the early days that really popped, you know, at some point, um, maybe 2012 or something going back, they have reverted ultimately back to roughly where they were um, when we originally started looking at them because they were not able to grow and they didn't really have a, a strong moat or maybe the moat was, was something shifted, the competitive landscape changed. And so the valuation was not enough to sustain, um, you know, a, a return on that stock. And so um, as I studied businesses and just kind of looked around, I thought, God, there's got to be a better way. You know, all of our investors were just it's, it's, it's a group of families, including my own family. And we have a long term time horizon. And I looked around and said, you know, there's got to be a better way to do this. Why can't we buy businesses that invest in businesses? Why can't we find um, undervalued businesses um, that we can hold for longer periods of time um, that don't require just being, we don't have to turn over the portfolio uh, the second the stock hits some estimate of what we think it should be 
it would sell for as a private business, for example. Uh, and so um, maybe around 2015, 16, um, really started changing the way that we look at businesses. And, and there was a period where the portfolio was kind of straddling um, maybe special situations and some deep value with businesses that were much higher quality um, that we thought we could hang on to. And so that was the beginning of maybe the, the transition, if, if there was a transition. Um, so still looking for value, but value defined as um, long-term earning power that's misunderstood versus just looking at it from, from a rear view mirror, but instead shifting and looking at kind of the, the front mirror uh, or, or the, 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 um, the, the windshield instead of the rearview mirror, I should say. Right, right. So, um, uh, w- would you mind uh, expanding your view on on those times? You know, where where yeah. you really transitioned from? Yeah, right. Well, I think that um, I, I think. Sorry, I think the second part of your question was something about uh, younger investors um, wanting to get into. Right, right. Yeah. So, um, on that, I would say that you know you. Investing is just a, a, you need to look at all kinds of investing. I think it's, it's just great. There's a lot of ways to make money in investing. There's a lot of really great investors that do things very, very differently. Um, there's great short sellers. There's great day traders. There are great long short managers. There are there's so many different strategies. I have really close friends that run really different strategies from me, and they're and they're all they're successful because it's a it's a it's maybe. Um, they found uh, a, a style of investing that's a fit for their personality. So my only advice would be for a young person to get out there and, and look at all different ways to make money in the market and find something that is really a fit for their own personality because investing is hard and you will go through periods where whatever you do is out of favor and you need to be able to still um, be excited about getting up in the morning and doing it when it's hard and when when the the wind is um, not at your back, but if you're, you know, when, when you're, you know, when things are hard, and um, if you're if you're trying to pursue a strategy only because you thought it made money or would make money, it's difficult to become great at that strategy uh, over time. So, um, my advice would be to look around and and really get to know yourself and and, and try to find a match between an investing strategy and and who you are as a person. So that, that's fantastic. So uh, I, I'd be very interested to uh, learn a little bit on this, uh, on different, you know, um, types, of, types of investing characteristics uh, where, you know, I, I would term it as sometimes, you know, once we are very happy understanding, you know, value investment, we generally fall into the prey of the, uh, it as a religion and... <laughs> Uh, and, and a lot of us actually, you know, kind of uh, undermine the other ways of investing. And uh, Jeremy, with your wisdom and with your understanding of investing, yeah. do you particularly see one superior than other or something wins over the another um, yeah. more over a period of time? Yeah. So I think there's two things I would say. First is that um, if you know, some, Warren Buffett was an enormous, um, in, had an enormous impact on, on my, my career and how I think about investing. And um, the, the two big takeaways I have from Warren Buffett, and um, I think everybody maybe has something different that they take from him, but um, the, the impact that he's had on me is, is, are two things. One, uh, look at a business or look at a stock as if you're buying the entire business. So that's the most fundamental kind of Buffett lesson that I learned um, you know, studying Buffett, you know, as a kid. The second thing is the 20 punch, the 20 hole punch card um, mindset, which is, you know, a, a pretend that what if you only had 20, if you could only make 20 decisions um, and you had to punch a card every time and you knew that once you punch that 20th hole that you couldn't make another decision. So make very, very few and infrequent decisions. Um, and so if you're buying a business, if you're buying a stock, if you're buying the entire business and you can only make a few decisions, you should make infrequent decisions. And you know that, that you're going to then by default, you're going to hold those businesses for long periods of time. And you need to 
kind of try to outperform some kind of benchmark, and in my case, the S&P 500, you need to think about those things. You need to think about, okay, if I'm going to buy this business and hold it, does it have the earning power, the sustainable earning power to continue on um, to potentially outperform um, you know, 500 of the best, some of the best businesses in the world that make up the S&P 500. It's a tall order. Um, and we don't, we, you know, we don't trade options. Um, we're not a levered fund. So um, we are, when we look at a business, it's got to be like, hey, can, do we think that over the next, you know, few years um, that one, the earning power is is misunderstood in a way where we have an advantage, where we can figure something out that maybe the market's not willing to pay for today. Um, that will are we are we buying earning power that's mispriced, and we're we buying earning power that will ultimately allow this stock to 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 beat the market. That's how we're looking at it. Um, there are other people, and there are people that are very very successful, just only looking at valuation and saying, hey, I think that this stock trades for some discount to book value or discount to what it would trade for in a in a private transaction, and uh, maybe that stock at some point for whatever reason. Um, moves up 20% or 50% and they're, they're good at capturing that and trading it and then moving on to the next stock and, and uh, that kind of mean reversion strategy, which um, in my opinion is not, has nothing to do with the way Warren Buffett invests. Um, somehow that has gotten mixed up with value investing. Um, but when I think about value investing, I think about how do we buy um, a future dollar for a discount today? Because investing is about buying the future. It's not about buying the past. So even a day trader is still buying the future. And so um, if you are always anchoring your bias towards things that have happened in the past and using that as a margin of safety, you really are driving um, in, you know, in the rearview mirror and, and not looking ahead. I mean, it's a nice reference for what's happened in the past, but um, the world is changing very, very quickly, and it will continue to change faster and faster. And to just kind of ignore the world and say, hey, I just am going to bet that this there's going to be no change at this business, and that as a result of no change, that I'm just going to be able to beat a collection of you know the best businesses in the world as an index, I think that's that's a difficult um, task to do unless you maybe just are really good at trading, which I'm not. So um, again, our strategy is a reflection more of my personality than um, than anything. And there's people, there are people that are really great at all different types of value investing. Monish Fabry talks about one of his talks. He talks about the the, the tent underneath the tent of value investing. There's there are a lot of different ways to make money. Um, and so, no, I don't think that there's one necessarily superior to the other. If you have a personality that lends itself to being really good at at, at your you know, niche and your specialty uh, in, in that underneath the, you know, the, the value tent. Thanks for giving us some perspective and setting the context for our conversation today, Jeremy. Your hedge fund, JDP Capital, has developed a survivor and thriver criteria for screening great investment candidates. And you explain in one of your recent interviews that you have literally researched the impact of the same criteria going back to the Great Depression. For interested mm -hmm. HNWIs and high net worth families, yeah. could you shed some light on the summary of your peak to peak research and explain <laughs> yeah. the survivor and thriver criteria sure. with a past yeah. investment example? Sure. So, so <laughs> It's it's kind of hokey, but um, survivor and thriver criteria. It's it's basically the lens which we try to look at every investment through. So it's a quality lens. So it's 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 a qualitative lens for screening quality. Um, it's not a quantitative lens, um, and it doesn't really refer to how we would think about a company in terms of valuation, because valuation is more a reflection of um, what our cost of capital is and what we're trying to achieve, um, and generally where markets are. But as we were looking for maybe a steady state list of criteria that would accomplish two things. So one would um, help us maybe hang on to great businesses when they were down a lot or add to them and hold on when others can't. And also recognize when we've made a mistake 
that um, is more fundamental than just the stock price going down, for example. So we looked at um, company, we looked at kind of companies and going back, you know, like you said, to, to around the Great Depression. And, and again, going back that far, there's less and less uh, detail on individual companies. But the idea was to say um, that in, as a long-term investor, um, time is more important and the quality of the business is more important than the timing of the investment. And so the idea was with peak to peak was, well, let's kind of just identify more or less some major peaks throughout the last 80 years um, and assume that, you know, time was not on your side and you had to buy at the absolute peak of a cycle of a, 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 a and then you had to hold all those businesses in the market through the next cycle. And obviously during that time, some companies would get sold or some companies would go away, but just as a general idea that just as a, you know, it's a very qualitative exercise to say, look, if you didn't have time on your side, what would life look like? Um, what would businesses look like? Who would outperform? Which businesses would outperform and why would they outperform? And we started seeing some characteristics in the businesses that, um, that seemed to, to do the best, that did outperform when time wasn't on their side, meaning they were, they were purchased at really inopportune times in the market. Kind of drilled it, or kind of boiled it down to four characteristics that we, that we call the survivor and thriver company criteria. The idea is that, you know, like I said, this isn't designed just to, um, this isn't designed, we're not putting this in a quantitative screen of some kind and saying, hey, spit out some, spit out some answers. Um, it's just a way to think about a business, um, think about a stock. Um, hey, is this a potential criteria? Is this a potential business that we want to continue researching? Um, because every day there's, there's all kinds of ideas that may come our way. Our company looks really cheap or it looks interesting um, or, wow, this technology looks like it could be, you know, 100x from now. I mean, so we needed to have some kind of, I don't know, um, filter, if you will. And so they're just... The, the, the criteria is simple. It's the first thing is a business model that is adaptable and relevant in tomorrow's economy. Um, the second one is durable pricing power protected by a growing competitive advantage. The third is capital allocation and balance sheet that supports the company's moat. So again, this is kind of addressing um, mistakes that we've made in the past um, and reasons we see that companies maybe don't survive and thrive over time. And the fourth thing is a significant alignment of interest between management and, and equity holders. Then on top of that, we, we layer in valuation. It's more of a function of the business itself um, and our own, uh, our own uh, hurdle rate as a, as a fund. So um, if a company seems like any four, any one of those four isn't really there, we don't invest. It's a quick no. Hey, it's a super amazing idea. It's a cheap company. It's five cents on the dollar, but the management is really shady. Or we think that management could potentially screw the minority shareholders. We don't buy it. We don't touch it. And again, these are these. This comes as a culmination of making a lot of mistakes in the past, and of course, we'll continue to make mistakes. But, or for example, there's a balance sheet that um, doesn't doesn't help the company's moat. That doesn't strengthen the long term advantage of the business. Some debt may be appropriate for some businesses and other businesses debt is not appropriate. So we need to think about debt in context of the moat of the business. Does it support the company's moat? Um, does the business, do we think the business is gonna be more relevant tomorrow? Because if we're gonna own a business for two, three, four years, we want our five years or longer, we wanna make sure that the business is more relevant in the future, not less relevant, because there's no such thing as a, is a, is a, is a, is a no change at all. There's always change. So this idea that the business doesn't change is, is not true. Either your business is, your business is always more relevant or less relevant. So we wanna make sure that we understand why the business is becoming more relevant in the future. Um, and so this is just a, a, a little bit of a work in progress, um, but a high level, um, guardrail, if you will, for, for um, not only being able to, you know, helping us um, hold a business when it's hard, but also sell when, when no longer, when one of those four criteria um, is not, we feel like is no longer being met. Uh, very interesting. So 
I, I'd like to understand more. I mean, um, educate me on this a little bit more because I think this question uh, would be interesting to many of the audiences that we have. Uh, so, as you mentioned, that the balance sheet is not supporting the moat, um, and and then the overarching factor of the management, uh, which is not supporting the shareholders. So, can you can you uh, uh, explain? Explain this phenomena because this phenomena is everywhere. So, uh, can you just, with some example, even if you don't take names, but yeah, with some example yeah. in a business, yeah. can you educate us how to look into these things? You know, how so do we the understand? Balance sheet, yeah. So, yeah, please, when we look at businesses that, um, let, let me let me take a let me take a step back um, here. I, I made some notes because. Um, let me take a step back and just refer to um, kind of the last peak to peak um, that we have looked at. So the last major peak, and again, this is just for conversation purposes. Uh, people should feel free to go do their own research or may disregard this altogether. But if you go back to the last major, major peak, which was October, 7, October 8th, 2007. So this was the highest day of the market just before the great financial crisis began. So if you think about it, that's probably that would be the worst timing. If you went all in on the market on October 8th, 2007, you could probably say that's the worst time imaginable to 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 buy stocks. And so what we did is we just said, OK, well, of the companies that were 250 million or more market cap, so somewhat investable um, and they were you just held those companies um, in the these are U.S. companies um, until kind of today or maybe last month. And again, this is not designed, I mean, this isn't necessarily realistic that you would do this, but just as a, as a baseline, um, as for reference, there were six, a little over 1,600 companies that were continuously traded between um, October 8th, 2007 and today. And so it's 14.7 years. Um, and the um, S&P 500, now again, this is the worst time imaginable to to hold a bit to, to make an investment decision um, so or to buy a company or to make an investment um, the S&P 500 in the end compounded at about 9.3 percent a year so 279 percent um, but the top 10 percent of those 1600 companies the median return was over a thousand percent 17 and a half percent annualized top 25 percent 400 percent and the top 50 percent was a little over 200 percent um, and you contrast that with the bottom 10% return for those 1,600 continuously traded companies lost 83% of their value. The bottom 25% lost 60% and the bottom 50% lost about 18% of their value. So again, this isn't looking at the S this isn't looking at the components of the S&P 500. This is just looking at continuously traded stocks in the headquartered in the U.S. Um, with at least 250 million in market cap. Um, but what that tells us is, you know, when you drill down and look at the, especially the under the companies that really that underperformed or that lost, you know, between 18 and 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 80 percent of their market cap over that 14 and a half years, why is it that they you know, was it just pure valuation um, that caused that? Well, no, um, there are things that happened in the business. The business had something happen to it that caused it to not be able to recover at the same time the top you know 50 percent or so of of the of the businesses that either either kept up with the s p or outperformed the s p by quite a lot um, had qualities that allowed it to outperform and so just thinking about that it's not just a question of interest rates because if it was a question of low interest rates, then you wouldn't have so many businesses that that had permanent impairment, a permanent loss over that period of time. And a lot of those businesses, and, and I'm not going to call them out on this, but um, you're, people are feel, can are, are free to screen do the same screen on Cap IQ or wherever they screen stocks. But many many of those companies were cheap, statistically cheap. 14 and a half years ago, and they're just as cheap, if not cheaper today. So price alone, it, price is important, but price alone is not, um, th th is not going to allow you to beat the market if you hold a business for a long period of time. 
surviving and thriving as a business is not just a function of price. You need the business needs it has it has to have characteristics that allow it to maintain its competitive advantage, to, to grow its competitive advantage, maintain margins, and a lot of that has to do with you know reinvesting at you know at, at, at reinvesting um, at at incrementally higher rates of return. Um, it has to do with with having a company culture that allows you to get up every day and kind of grow and and just not do stupid things. So the criteria around balance sheets is, hey, you know, debt, there are businesses where you can have non-recourse debt, for example, maybe a car dealership. A car dealership takes on fleet debt um, from, you know, that's, that's securitized by the vehicles on the lot. That's not necessarily holding company debt. Um, that's just a part, that's just a way that a dealership, um, that's just the way that the, the business model works. There's, it's called fleet financing. So if you just screened the, the the kind of the debt associated with the typical auto dealership, maybe it would look really indebted. And maybe some people that are afraid of debt would say, no, that looks indebted. But you drill down further and you go, no, that debt is actually appropriate for the business because it's non-recourse debt um, that's associated with the individual cars on the lot that's generally financed right. by the car manufacturer, so-called fleet financing. And if, for example, that auto dealership didn't have any hold code debt, but was actually just printing free cash flow and growing, um, you say, wow, this is a great business. And they're using debt appropriate that's appropriate for the business. The other side of that might be the opposite, where you know, in addition to that fleet financing, the hold co had just enormous amounts of debt and had taken on debt to do acquisitions that didn't really work out or had some hopes and dreams of getting into businesses unrelated to their core business um, and just generally you know, over levered um, with recourse debt that, for example, would, if you couldn't clearly see how taking on that debt was helping their competitive advantage, was helping build that business, um, was aiding the moat, um, then for us, it would be a no. So th that's how we would think about balance sheet, uh, the debt and balance sheets um, overall. But um yeah, I think, it's, you know, dr drilling down on this stuff is important because you can't just, there's, there's not one size fits all. I, I think I can, I can get you like, for example, uh, if I, if I try to simply simplify the way you have mentioned this, so uh, a car dealership having fleet financing. Yeah. So a company being more credit worthy, uh, getting more fleet financing is actually building a better moat in that kind of business since this is a well, core yeah, yeah, something it, like that. Well, I would just, I would just, it just, we just want to make sure that, I mean, there's no hard and fast rule. All, all, all we're saying with that, that third survivor and survivor company tree is that the capital allocation and the balance sheet strategy of the business needs to support the company's moat. So the company has a moat of some kind. Um, but what happens sometimes is companies become, if the company becomes over leveraged, they can no longer defend their moat. Right. So the right. capital allocation includes their balance is their balance sheet strategy so the same thing could be said with um spending too much on buybacks and and not reinvesting in their own business there are businesses that are just like hey we print tons of money and we're just going to sort of ignore the capex needs of the business and just pile into our stock and again not going to name some names but there's some really famous companies that have gotten into a lot of trouble by thinking they can just perpetually buy back stock and they look up you know, two or three years later and realize they have underinvested in their core business. And so they've punched a hole, so to speak, in their moat. So we're looking for a capital allocation and balance sheet strategy that supports the company's moat. Or if, if anything, just doesn't impact the company's moat, but ideally supports the company's moat. We don't want somebody to take, we don't want a business to use debt for the wrong reasons or use it, use debt in a way that hurts the business. Generally, like to stay away from debt, and we've we've of course you know made mistakes investing in companies that had too much debt, and that's that's where this that's where this third criteria comes from. Um, we don't want to invest in companies that are just levered up to do you know some something that that is going to hurt the business or is hurting the business. I I think I think now I'm I'm completely getting you. Uh, I, I think I'm clear on this this way. So you were, you were talking about analyzing 
this balance sheet which is supporting the moat because because as we know moat is actually came from the fundamental business thinking that the founder did or the market actually allowed so yeah. Uh, so the capital yeah. allocation that is, yeah. And let me talk about another situation. Um, so there, there are companies that took advantage of very high prices in 2020 um, to do an at the money equity raise. And these are companies that um, may not have even needed the money, but just saw that they could sell, you know, five, five percent or three percent or some percentage of their equity and take in cash at, a, at very, very attractive prices and just let it sit on their balance sheet um, with this idea that we may not have an ability to raise money this cheap in the future. We saw people doing convertible debt um, deals in, you know, in, in 2020 and 2021 even at just incredible um, prices at prices that were a clear advantage to the issuing company. Um, and maybe that debt just sits there on the, or I'm sorry, maybe that cash just sits there on the balance sheet, but for example, today, if they were trying to, to raise capital, it would be much, much more expensive. So, yes, they diluted the right. stock by something, but now they have billions and billions in cash on the balance sheet and they can take advantage of much weaker competitors. And so that's Absolutely. also an example of, of, of and we have companies on in, in, in our portfolio um, like that that really took advantage of stock prices in 2000 and in 2020 um, to raise probably more cash than they even need. But now it kind of looked like, why are they doing that back then? And they're living within their own free cash flow. But now they have a balance sheet that their competitors don't have, and they can take advantage of of, of smaller competitors that um, were living on venture funding or just don't have the money to make an acquisition or don't have the money to double down on really great talent. Um, um, you know, and, and they do, for example. So, it's just we're just looking for a capital allocation and balance sheet strategies that supports the company's moat. So it's not a it's not a hard fast rule around some multiple of EBITDA debt to EBITDA or, but but if you know you want a business manager or leader that is a team that is cognizant of wow our stock is really overvalued, and we can sell a little bit and take in all this cash because we think that over the next couple of years we'll be able to deploy it in a really really attractive way. That's great. That doesn't mean that every business should do that. But there are some businesses, depending on where they are in their cycle, that that is a great idea. There are other businesses that, um, you know, may benefit by doing nothing. Uh, maybe they don't issue debt. Maybe they don't issue equity. But because they, they're able to, to continue to support and grow their moat with, you know, with doing very little, making no acquisitions and making and, and selling no stock and, and not issuing any debt. So we just want to make sure that the capital allocation um, of the business is really good for the businesses moat and long-term value creation and not just kind of unknown. We, we really want to understand what that is and, and see um, that it's creating value for the business. So that's, that's the, right, that's right, the third criteria. <laughs> right, right. Completely, completely makes sense. And, and it's, it's, uh, it's quite, uh, it's not algorithmic at all. I can, I can completely guess that. And um, in line with that, as as I had a second follow up on that yeah. on the management thing on the on the management thing that you that mm -hmm. you mentioned that sure how how do we how do we tally do we look at management also in that direction what what are the core few things that you generally think about when you mm. when you try to look at uh, company management so the fourth criteria um, what we we say that we want to see a significant alignment of interest between management and equity holders because if you can figure out um, where the incentive is, like Charlie Munger said, um, he'll show you the outcome if you can find the incentive. So uh, we want to see where there's an alignment of interest. Some of our biggest mistakes, I'd say, two of them in general, but one in particular, um, biggest mistake of our of our fund's history um, in terms of just emotional mistake, and we spent you know, more than a year on a business. And it wasn't as big, it wasn't a huge financial loss, but it was a, it was a kind of a big punch in our gut was um, we got everything right, except the alignment of interest between the controlling shareholder and the minority investors. And um, there was a lot of mistakes in that, in that whole, um, in, in, in that investment. But as far as, you know, we probably talked about the investment too much. Um, we did a lot of decks and went out and told the world how, how great our research was and um, how there was no way we could lose. 
And in the end, we actually knew that the, the alignment of interest really wasn't there. We knew that the controlling shareholder didn't really care what happened to the minority holders and was potentially willing to take advantage of them in a really material way. And we just ignored it because we thought, well, the company is so cheap and it's such a high quality business. It was an infrastructure business and um, it was really misunderstood. And um, we just sort of ignored this idea that, um, and it was, we had had the survivor and thriver criteria and we were just so overwhelmed with um, just the potential upside and um, how cheap it was again and how high quality the, you know, the market position of the company. And um, we just sort of lost sight of, of this fourth, but very important attribute, which is you need an alignment of interest between the, the, the controlling shareholder or the founding shareholder or the, the management team or, or whoever is kind of driving the ship and the minority investor. Now we're obviously a lot more uh, concerned about that and, and put that maybe that should be number one instead of number four. We want, we want to know that, um, that, that management wins when we win, that we're all aligned somehow. And in different businesses, that looks different. You know, um, you know Bill Gates was famous for not having a salary at all. I think he took $1. And um, there's other CEOs out there that run really big companies that are controlling shareholders and they take you know, salary. Daniel Eck is, is, a, is another uh, CEO that's famous for not taking a salary. And I'm not saying that not taking a salary is, is what we're looking for either, but um, it's great that you know, people should be compensated for what they do. And maybe they're not a super wealthy CEO and, and this is um, a way to align and the compensation package is aligned with the minority holders. We just wanna make sure that, that everybody is on board, um, that we're all getting up in the morning and, and focused on the same things, long-term value creation. And it's not just a collegial kind of CEO that's, that's elected by the board, um, to do short term to make short term decisions because he or she is going to you know potentially you know just a hired gun that's there to make a few changes and then leave with their alignment is is different than our what, what we're trying to get out of the business so if we're making a you know multi year investment we want to make sure that the that the management team is is focused on goals and achieving goals that um, we think are going to going to unlock that value over the next uh, three, three, four, five, ten plus years. So um, that's 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 all. I think it's just more of um, um, and, and in most cases, I think management probably is aligned to either the stock price or, or you know, outperforming their 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 the goals that are set for them operationally. Um, but every now and then, if you're not careful, you you will find situations um, where the controlling shareholder or even the CEO, there, there, is, there is not an alignment of interest with the long-term investor. Jeremy, now shifting the gears towards our young audiences, Jeremy, for those who are not in the investment management industry, they might only see that the sole responsibility of an investment manager is to invest well. Yeah. But as hedge fund managers ourselves, mm -hmm. We know that there are so many things a fund manager needs to do other than making investments and researching securities. Could you briefly touch on the other side of investment management as a business yeah, sure. and tell our audiences a few important things one needs to know before stepping into this industry and how to really go about doing it? Um, <laughs> it's, there's, there's a lot there. Um, you need it first of all you need to find like i was saying earlier you need to find an area of investing that really reflects your personality because things aren't always easy so you need to find an area of investing um that you you're so excited about that you would be willing to do it almost for free you know there's like an old there's kind of this I, I, I heard somebody say one time that they were they were so excited about investing that they would they would do it even hungover, and I thought that was a <laughs> I thought that was a great way of putting it. I mean, you're so excited about something, <laughs> no matter what state you're in, um, you, you would want to be looking at companies, or you would want to be thinking about markets, or you would want to be talking to management teams, or whatever it is that you that you know the area you just want to be so excited about it that that, you know, even Buffett talked about in an interview with Bill Gates one time that he probably would have been willing to do it if somebody pushed, put, put like bread and water underneath the door, and, you know, locked in a room 
long as he could just, as long as he could stay alive, you know, he would do it for free. I think that's the first step. He had to be, find that passion um, about an area of investing. And um, a lot of people start by saying, hey, I'm a value investor. Well, like I was saying earlier, there's many, many ways within value investing to make money. There are people that are successful interpreting uh, markets. Um, you know, it's a very qualitative thing, the way you inter what, the way you see a company, the way I see a company, the way, you know, investor Rick down the street sees a company are going to be very, very different. Um, so kind of figuring out how you work, how you tick and, and, and finding a niche within investing that makes sense for you. I mean, George Soros was obviously very, very successful, but his investing style is probably the opposite of Buffett's style. Uh, Carl Icahn was a very, very successful uh, investor as an activist. Um, obviously, he's, you know, this year was, was selling um, his stake in, in a company that Warren Buffett couldn't buy enough of. So there's not one way. It's, it's we're all going to see the same thing differently. So we need to kind of take a step back and respect that. And the second thing is, I would say, you know, find find a company or or something with you know once you kind of identify what that is and drill down try to try to learn everything you can about what you're trying to do just everything you can um, find somebody that will listen to you whether like in in, in my case um we try to become obsessed with with a handful of businesses and not the market and try to know those businesses better than anyone um, and maybe for some investment strategies that's actually a handicap because they can't trade them um, uh, and time because they need to make monthly returns or weekly returns. But for other strategies, that's actually a huge advantage because it allows us to hang on to the business when other people can't or add to the position when other can't, others can't. So I would say next you want to find, you need to find investors that um, are as like-minded as possible. I mean, you're never going to find 100% of your investor base that, that thinks exactly like you because at the end of the day, people are just trying to make money and they're making a bet on you that you'll that you'll be able to make money, but you know, communicating the strategy and communicating expectations with investors is is is, is important. Um, we're still learning. Um, I think it's something you, you continue to learn. I don't think it's something you ever get you ever perfect at. Um, I'm not a you know a famous. I, I, I'm not. I don't think of myself as a great writer, for example, or um, some kind of unusually amazing communicator. Um, but you have to just keep trying um, and make sure that you're able to communicate what you're doing to your investors and, and, and hopefully make sure that you don't have investors that, that, that completely misunderstand what you're doing and, and then become a source of a, a problem um, for, you know, clouding your judgment. Um, you want to make sure that their time horizon is, is more or less aligned with whatever time horizon you are investing for, as an example. So those are some of the side, that's the side of the business I think a lot of people don't talk about is, um, you know, the, the investors, because it's someone else's money, a lot of times drive the decisions, and, you know, especially like a year like this, which has been really difficult uh, at one point, kind of for every strategy, it seemed. Um, but, you know, just looking at presentations that are available on the web or on Twitter of, of really big funds um, with, you know, mostly institutional capital, you, know, you see how quickly... Um, people change. Um, they they go from loving a sector to hating a sector to loading up on another sector that they may or may not have a lot of expertise on because that's sort of what's in. And you know there are cases, there are situations where that that works because that's what their investors expect them to do. Um, and I think there's other people and other investors might say, no, it's not what we signed up for. So um, you just have to make sure that you're on a path that. Is manageable for you, right? So, uh, uh, what what I understood uh, uh, through your discussion of this uh, on the side of making real good investment decision when you were having your own niche on, you know, picking up investment, uh, you know, stocks or, or 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 a great business, actually managing and synergize synergizing between you know the parties involved on the other side um, is equally important, and and for that. You not only need business picking skills rather than a lot of people skill to really build this business up, right? Uh, mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. Does does that really mean that? Uh, yeah. yeah, you just need alignment of interest. I mean, just like we're looking for an alignment of interest between the companies we invest in, the management teams we invest in, and ourselves, we also need alignment of interest between 
you know, our fund and, um, and our investors uh, to some degree, I mean, it's never going to be perfect, but, um, you need somewhat of alignment of interest in order to, to make it happen because it's not going to always be easy. I don't care what your strategy is. Um, <laughs> I mean, there's many, 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 many examples of whatever you pick the sector, you pick the strategy, and there are periods of time when those things are in. And those are the smartest people in the room. Sometimes it's a, it's a region of the world that's kind of the hottest new thing. There are periods of time where emerging markets, everybody can't get enough. There's a periods of time, there are periods of time where, where you know, natural resources or oil and gas or whatever, that you can't get enough. There's periods of time where those are hated. Um, there's periods of time when people want to buy growth stocks. And there's periods of time when people can't stand growth stocks. So it's always going to move around and you need to have an anchor in what you're doing and be able to find a way to communicate, um, you know, your long-term, what you're trying to do with, with, with your investors, because things are not going to always be easy. It's really easy to be like, yeah, look how cheap XYZ sector is. Everybody come jump on board. But then what happens when, when that changes, do you just wind the fund down? Uh, no, you have to be able to say, okay, well, you know, this is part of a, I guess if, if your only strategy, if, you, if your strategy was to, to execute a trade, then maybe you would wind the fund down, but you need to, you know, the investment, the, the business needs to be more than just that you need to kind of find investors that are aligned with what you're, what you're trying to do beyond just, um, whatever the opportunity set in front of you at that moment in time is because that opportunity set is constantly evolving. It's constantly changing. Um, so people need to understand that about what, what you're trying to do, because otherwise your investors will trade you like a stock, like a hot potato. <laughs> so, so um, they don't understand right. what you're doing and they just think you're, you know, they don't understand and there's a, there's a misalignment there, then they don't know how to think about you when, when you're underperforming, they don't know how to right, think about right. you when you're outperforming. Absolutely. On, on this, Jeremy, I, I, this is something that I really need to understand more. And I, I think, uh, since we have come to this junction, uh, so as you mentioned that, you know, aligning the interests, um, uh, which essentially means uh, the more you want to align, the more you need to filter, <laughs> uh, the more you need to possibly, the, the tighter you make the filter, the deeper or the more outreach you need to make, the mm -hmm. more people you need to possibly mm -hmm. communicate, right? So, mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. uh, it, so it's, it's, I, I think it's easier to, you know, not synergize and go by the trend and, you know, uh, bring in money and then, Hot you know, money, something yeah, wind yeah, yeah. up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what you are saying is actually a difficult thing to do. So how do we really, uh, you know, how you do know, you do that? Or how do we, how can we do that? I don't know. know. I mean, it's, uh, um, like I, yeah. everybody, if you look at successful and uh, all these successful investors um, that have been able to do it, um, they all have a different journey. You can read about, I mean, there's investors that talk about how they've done it. Um, and you know, I don't need to name them off, but they all kind of have a different story. They all started at different times. They all had a different, I, I, I think that, you know, you need, everybody needs to look around them and, and, and ask what advantages do I have? You know, what, what cards did, did life deal me? Uh, wh what are the cards that have been dealt to me? And, um, you know, do you know one person that might be like-minded potential investor? And then maybe that person has friends that are similar minded and, um, I think it's about, you know, starting with one person and growing and building a reputation and letting that compound and everybody does it differently. Um, everybody has a different network. Everybody comes from a different background, a different part of the world. And so looking around you and, and saying, what do I have around me that I can, um, you know, just leverage, but leverage in a good way. You know, hey, I know one person and, and or my, my, I have an uncle who this might sound great too, or that it also has the same vision, shares the same passion for investing and vision that I have. Um, and so let me see it maybe, or it's a, it, maybe it's a neighbor or, um, you know, when I started out, I um, actually met my first investor, uh, the family that, that helped back me at another um, investor's annual meeting. 
and we sat next to each other at a, at a dinner and um, just got along. And he said, hey, when you're in town where you live next time, give me a call. And I was in town, <laughs> as you can imagine, um, sometime <laughs> later. And, and we just continued the conversation. And nothing happened immediately, but we found that we both had you know, were passionate about similar things. And um, over time, built a relationship based on similar values. And um, he ultimately, you know, wrote the first check and then he brought in a like minded uh, family friend, or f a friend of his um, to 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 invest as well. So it's probably not that different than a lot of people's story uh, stories. You know, you have true, people that trust true. you and and the story is different for everybody. But it all started with, you know, we were in a, an environment where it, it was an, it had naturally filtered out everybody else. We, we were and it was. You know, we were sitting at a table of, of people that were, is highly refined group of people with a very, very specific meaning. It was refined down to a very specific uh, group of people with very specific interests in investing. It wasn't I wasn't at a real estate conference, for example, uh, trying to find, you know, or, or, or meeting somebody that was interested in stocks. This, you know, so maybe put yourself in the right environment to to find those people or to find like minded people. You know, there there are. Um, shareholder meetings of other really established large managers, if they'll let you go, if they'll let you attend, um, those can be great places to, to find, you know, Berkshire Hathaway, of course, has been um, a Woodstock for capitalists for a long time. And a lot of people go there and, and, you know, everybody around you is at least familiar with investing and interested in similar things. And um, I think that's one of the reasons that attracts so many investment professionals is because it's an, it's also a natural filter you just got to be a little bit entrepreneurial there. No, absolutely. absolutely. No, it's very helpful. Very helpful. Oh, thank you so much, Ahmed. And thank you, Jeremy, for sharing your thoughts and insights with us. And um, so uh, would, you, would you talk a little bit about the uh, seven powers by Hamilton Homo? What are your major learnings yeah. from that book? And how can we implement those lessons in our real life? It's just, I, I think at the end of the day, I think anytime you can develop, uh, I think Hamilton, first of all, Hamilton Homer, it's, it's, it's called the seven powers. Um, he's, he's a phenomenal, you know, um, thinker, economist, um, and has an interesting in, uh, approach to investing that evolves around, um, and I'm sure I'm butchering this, but it evolves around com understanding competitive advantage, because um, it is true that if you're going to make a long-term investment, what allows a business to compound and outperform over time is the ability for that company to hang on to an advantage of some kind. So every business, you know, starts out, Hamilton talks about how every business starts out with creating a, a product or a service of some kind. And then it's a matter of keeping some of the economics that they've created for themselves because competition will naturally erode that away. So why has Domino's pizza in, in America and in Europe been so successful as a business when there is seemingly no barrier to entry to start another pizza chain? And there are many, 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 many pizza chains, but why is Domino's so successful? Why is McDonald's so successful when seemingly it's just a hamburger, but it's not just a hamburger. There's something behind it that makes it, it's a whole package that makes it successful. Um, why has Nike been so successful when, you know, on paper, I guess it's just a company that makes shoes. Okay. So, but why have they made 50, why is their stock up something like 58,000% since it went public in the early eighties? And you can name a ton of other shoe manufacturers that have not been even remotely so successful. So Hamilton Ilmer is 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 somebody is somebody I admire because they've come up with a framework for thinking about um, the power that a business has in order for it to be you know identifying that power um, for a business to be um, successful. And so there's there's a lot of podcast interviews on on these seven powers, and I don't have them all memorized. Um, some are they're really interesting stories. He, I think he was an early investor in Netflix. Um, uh, because he saw kind of the, this idea that Blockbuster wasn't going to be able to just, you know, throw away their old rental business um, and compete with them head to head streaming. 
Um, and, you know, I think they got close, but they, they couldn't really execute on the streaming stuff the way, the way Netflix could. It's, it's interesting story. I encourage anybody to go read, um, read his book or listen to podcasts on, on that. But I think, you know, for us, we also have, we have our kind of four survivor and thriver criteria. It's, it's in this, in the similar vein of, um, and maybe we should just use the seven powers and not try to reinvent the wheel. Um, to be fair, I mean, we created these the survivor and thriver framework that we use. I mean, before I had read the seven powers, but yeah, I just admire, I admire, Interesting. I admire this approach to looking at business. Business is much more than, like I said earlier, business is much more than just looking and saying, Hey, can I buy a dollar? A dollar for 10 cents isn't as black and white as it sounds. Um, if you are a long-term investor, the money is made by identifying things like competitive advantage and moat and how that translates to earning power. There's more money to be made doing that than just saying, oh, the balance sheet says this and I can buy it for a discount. I mean, that's, you know, um, that's one way. But I, you know, again, people are successful doing that. But I think if you're looking for Nike in 1982, you're looking for Starbucks in the 90s, you're looking for um, Domino's Pizza in the 90s, you know, you're looking for McDonald's in the 70s, you're looking for a Walmart um, when they went public, you're trying to under, you're looking for those types of returns. Um, you're looking for Berkshire Hathaway in the seventies, for example, why, why would you know, without doing any research, you know, Berkshire Hathaway was never, you know, I mean, since Warren Buffett took over to my knowledge, it never traded for like 10 cents on the dollar. Um, as far as a screen, I mean, it always was living, you know, you know, in a range of fairly valued, somewhat fairly valued, maybe it was cheap. But it, it was never distressed prices or something. Um, and, in, sure. and for much of its life, Berkshire Hathaway traded fully valued from a screen perspective. But I think digging down deeper back then, you probably could have applied a different lens around competitive advantage and said, well, this guy Warren Buffett, he's just incredible. So as long as he stays alive um, and can continue doing what he's doing, this is probably a really undervalued company, even if you pay up for it. You know, that's sort of what we're, where we're at. We're looking for, you know, um, the Survivor and Thriver Fund is is trying to find businesses with earning power that that is really misunderstood, but is um, unrecognized. And it's maybe, maybe it's recognized, but people, for whatever reason, the market isn't willing to make the investment or, or they're not willing to look at it in that lens. They're just willing to look at it for the quarter, the next quarter, or what's happened in the past. Um, and they need to see, you know, some of those powers to use the Hamilton Elmer term translate through to a quarterly earnings before they, before they bid it up. So um, we just want to be ahead of that. And um, we want to own businesses where we can measure um, their progress um, and think about them in terms of power or, you know, competitive advantage, moat, um, and, and how that can be sustained and held. And um, otherwise, you're, you know, you're sort of just at the whims of, of trading around and, and um, you know, buying something you hope to trade in the near term. So like I said earlier, it's... Um, the seven powers is it's a great book um great group of people and i think hamilton's track record is probably probably very very good so jeremy i i have a follow-up on this uh as, as i can clearly see and, and i understand understand completely the merit of it you, you mentioning competitive advantage mode and um my uh, and and it, you said it very rightly that sometimes people try to understand a lot of the investors as well try to understand mode as whether it's copyable non-copyable but you cannot really see it in generalized right. it involves so many of parameters right mm -hmm. in, in as you said that pizza is copyable absolutely right but what's the mode of dominus right and right 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 so my, my follow-up question would be and and it's it's always fascinating to try to learn modes of different types of yeah. different businesses and how it varies and how it embeds into human nature and all of this but my question would be uh, to you, Jeremy, on this competitive, do you believe or think that a lot of the competitive advantage and moat is kind of built up on an unfair advantage that someone has in, or, or it's always craftable? Can I always craft a competitive advantage wherever I am, whoever I am, or 
it also needs some given unfair advantage that you have of your economy, time, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. place, education, family, and all of this. You mean from a business perspective or individual? Uh, generally, a business comes from okay. an individual. So yeah, I'm just yeah, saying yeah. that. Uh, okay, yeah. Can I just create? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, yeah, I think it depends on the, the country you're talking about. There are countries in the world where you do need to be, I mean, where you have, you're, you're just kind of, I mean, I mean, also in America, I think you could be born in a really bad situation in a, in a very disadvantaged uh, corner of America. And yeah, you would have a harder time. But um, historically, you know, some of the greatest businesses in America have been built by people that just came from very humble backgrounds or normal backgrounds. They weren't necessarily, um, you know, super rich parents that just wrote some big check. And I mean, I don't know. I mean, they're, they just it was grit and will that um, just crying. But I know that that doesn't always apply in other countries. I think there's other parts of the world where uh, no matter how much you try, maybe you need to be connected to a a leadership of the country or something in order to, in order to own a really, in order to have a very, very successful large business. Um, but as far as in America, you know, building competitive advantage is, is just, there's certain people that just have a, 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 a given business ability uh, that understand, that understand what it takes. They, they can see, they know how to shift and evolve and they, and they can go towards um, they have a bigger vision and, and they know how to, they know how to make changes. They know how to kind of see when they've made a mistake and quickly fix it. And um, they just get it. Um, and then there's other people that, that don't. So I think trying to flush that out, I mean, a typical example, and I don't know, you know, depending on where your, where your viewers are, are they may be familiar with um, Patagonia, the U.S. Uh, clothing company, and versus maybe a North Face. And for those, the people that know Patagonia, it's a cult-like clothing company. The pricing power that that company has is unbelievable. And it's not because it's a fashion necessarily. It's not like a Prada or a Louis Vuitton type of thing, but it is, it does come with it. When people buy Patagonia, they're buying what that brand stands for because they stand for what the brand stands for, sustainability, um, the correct treatment of, of the of the animals, maybe where the feathers come from and the coat or, and if you read the book about, about uh, the founding of, Patagonia, um, and the name of the book escapes me right now. Um, I think it's called "Let Let My People Go Surfing." You see, the, the, even to to get a job at Patagonia is hard because for every job applicate for every job, there's something like you know a thousand applicants, and it's been one of the most desirable companies to work for since its inception, and it's created a moat that you can't necessarily copy i mean you you, you kind of compare this to maybe north face and north face hey great brand big company focused on money cash flow big as part of vf brands you know global business fine you know probably a lot bigger in terms of successes but but it doesn't have that moat and that pricing power and that advantage that patagonia has it just doesn't and yeah it may be bigger like i said it may you know um a bigger advertising budget wider group of people but it's not the same when you buy a Patagonia vest, um, you're not buying it to stay warm. You're buying it because of, you can buy a vest from any any company, but you're willing to pay a premium um, to buy it for a different reason, I think, generally, than what you would maybe the reason you would buy a, a North Face vest. And um, you can't replicate what Patagonia has at North Face by just changing the CEO, for example. So it's a culture that was created from day one. And I'm not sure that his, the, the founder, and I, his name uh, escapes me because it's, a, it's a, a French-Canadian name, but I don't know if he planned it that way necessarily. I don't know if he realized that he was such a great business person, but he developed a culture over time that people admired him. And, and um, the workplace he created, there was examples that they talk about in the book. I guess he was one of the first um, to allow uh, women to bring their young babies to work with them. I don't know if this was in the early 80s or something, but he said, yeah, come on in. We'll put cribs by the by the desk. Bring your kids into work. Um, you know, th- little things like that. So people are like, wow, this guy really cares about us. And he really encouraged people to, like the title of the book, Let My People Go Surfing. He encouraged them to take a lot of time off during the year to reflect and think. And maybe that's a privileged, you know, not every company can do that, I understand. But that was a unique circumstance to Patagonia at the time and the values that the 
that the founder had. Um, he thought it was valuable that people took time off, a lot of time off to reflect and come back stronger and be creative. And so I think being able to identify that, even if it wasn't quantifiable in the, on the balance sheet and the income statement is very, very critical for investing. Very critical. Because if all you're able to do is just say, well, Patagonia sales are a hundred million. This other brand, random XYZ brand is 200 million. I can buy this one for this multiple. I can buy, you know, Patagonia. And Patagonia is not publicly traded, by the way, but just hypothetically, um, you know, Patagonia, if let's say it was, you know, 50% more expensive than just some random XYZ clothing company. Some people just be like, oh, the other XYZ clothing company is cheaper, so I'm going to buy that. But it almost guaranteed that they wouldn't, that even if they had paid less for the other company, that over time they would probably get beat by Patagonia. And that Patagonia would create more value because the the competitive advantage of the business is not going to pop out on the balance sheet. Google's search engine is not a line item on the balance sheet. The Nike Swish and the culture of Nike isn't a line item on the balance sheet. And so I think that you do need to have a very quantity, you do need to have, you need to be very value oriented and 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 quantitative and 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 focused on the numbers, but you also, to be a successful investor, need to balance that with understanding the mode of the business that will allow it to sustain that competitive advantage and sustain margins and, and grow. Because again, if you're not growing, you're dying. So how can we grow? How can we not only beat inflation, but how can we beat you know, the S&P 500? How can we beat the top 10 businesses in the S&P 500 over the next decade? And you're and you're thinking about those kinds of things when you're when you're trying to make you know three four five ten year investment decisions. You're not just saying, um, you know, what, what can I see in the numbers today? So yeah, it's hard and it's squishy, and it's not what finance people want to talk about or hear about. And it may or may not sell. I don't know if, if invest some investors may think that that's that's ridiculous. And uh, how do we know that you know that that Patagonia has a competitive advantage uh, in its culture over over, you know, North base. I just right. want, I just want to make money. Okay. But making <laughs> money, if it was that easy, everybody would do it. If it was that Absolutely. easy, <laughs> then there would be more than one McDonald's. Everybody's yes. tried, yes. but Burger King wouldn't be a fraction of the size of McDonald's. If, if you could just do it, you can't. So I think identifying those 1% businesses and the advantage they have in tomorrow's economy what I mean is when McDonald's got started, there was no drive through people did. There wasn't a drive through culture, but they recognized in tomorrow's economy, an economy that was faster paced where people wanted, but people would be more interested in just driving through and quickly getting their food instead of sitting down and eating it. And there was a massive market for that or Phil Knight with Nike. He said, there is going to be an enormous demand for people to wear tennis shoes when they're not playing sports someday. Men will walk around wearing tennis shoes and not leather shoes. Women will walk around wearing tennis shoes and not heels it, on a Saturday, even when they're not playing sports. So he invented this category, but it was because he thought, well, you know what? This is, these, these shoes are more comfortable and um, you can do more with them and uh, they're more versatile. And it is a part of a whole kind of change and in, 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 in evolution of a category that just didn't exist. Howard, uh, Howard Schultz with, uh, with, with Starbucks. He said, someday I think Americans will actually go to the coffee shop and, and we'll be able to sell um, expensive coffee drinks to the average American. I mean, when I was a little kid, I mean, my parents and, and everybody else's parents that I went to the house, they would just drink Folgers coffee and a drip coffee. You didn't go to Starbucks. Now those same, my aunts and uncles who only used to drink drip coffee, you know, it's called the early nineties and the late eighties or something when I was a little kid go into their house. They don't, they don't do that anymore. They go to Starbucks. So being able to say that, you know, how will this business be more relevant to the future than the past is also part of it. Um, not that Folgers isn't still relevant today, but Starbucks, look, all else being equal, looking at Folgers is a standalone business. If it was, which it wasn't versus Starbucks back in, and I know they're very, two very different businesses, but just as a category, hear me out. If you were to kind of look at them, um, I'm sure that, you know, the, the, the numbers were very different. Uh, the growth profile was very different. One was a mature business, like very established in every grocery store. Everybody drank Folgers. Then compare that to Starbucks in, I don't know, 1993, 1994. 
um, with, with, with a CEO that had a vision for changing the way Americans drink coffee. One was definitely more leverage to, to uh, being more relevant in the future than the past. And, and, and looking, out, looking out now, and I'm not, I'm not sure you would have been able to figure that out going back to 1993. I'm just saying that in the end, there was a lot more value created between then and now with Starbucks than there was owning Folgers because Folgers didn't create 80 billion of value in the last 15 or 20 years. Best they've held on to whatever they were earning in the mid 90s at best. So, right. and also on, also on the moat, as you mentioned, uh, the, the Howard Schultz story tells us that even after he showed the way to the Americans and also to the world in different other places, he's the only one who could break through the, the tea, tea drinking nation, China, you know, yeah. and make them drink yeah. coffee. So right, right, uh, right. nobody else could. <laughs> so yes, there's something there, you know. Yeah, and it's hard uh, yeah. because we're not venture investors. I mean, I, I'm not any kind of, I, I'm not a venture investor. I mean, I, I don't know, going back in time, I probably wouldn't have invested in, in, in Starbucks in 1993 because how would I know what the future held? You know, and looking back, these things all seem simple. But I do think along the way, they start to present themselves. These businesses get to a point where they're self-funding. You know, a newer business gets to this point where it's self-funding. It's living within its uh, internally generated free cash flow. Um, and you can start to see and do research and see that, wow, what they're trying to do is actually working and is growing. And this is the trend. When you go out on the street, you could see more and more people were going to Starbucks. They were going to a coffee shop and drinking at home. You could do the research let's call it in the late 90s, and you could see that this was actually happening. It wasn't a venture bet. That would have been an example of where you could say, yeah, you know what, this makes sense. Maybe it wouldn't have made sense. Uh, maybe the risk reward wouldn't have, would have been much less clear and more venture oriented maybe in the late 80s or something or 90s in the case of Starbucks. But you didn't have to wait until 2022 to say that Starbucks is going to be successful. So I think it's, it's finding that balance for you as an investor um, in a way that, you know, you, you, that makes sense for, and, and, and the risk reward and the risk reward profile of, of the price kind of all culminating together um, in a way that, that makes sense for what you're trying to achieve. Well, Jeremy, uh, you've been so generous with your time and we do not want to hold you for so long. Why don't you tell our audience about JDP Capital Management and how to follow you on social media? Well, I'm not a social media. Uh, I don't really use Twitter that much, um, but uh, you can go to jdpcap.com. And uh, if you're a qualified investor, you can send us an email. We'll put you in our distribution list and you get our updates and, and performance. Uh, so yeah, if you're a qualified investor, please send us a message and we'll put you on the distribution list. Otherwise, you know, the fund is really for, you know, for high net worth people. But um, other than that, uh, every now and then, you know, there's, there's letters and stuff that get out there. They're leaked. Uh, people post them here and there, but uh, jdpcap.com and send us an email if you're interested in learning more. Sure. We'll, we'll make sure to put all the links in the description box below. And thank you all for joining us today. This show is sponsored by Air Capital. For more details and updates, please visit www.ar.capital. I'd also like to announce that our pre-launch annual report is out for your weekend's reading. The links will be provided in the description box below. If you liked today's episode, then hit like, subscribe, and press the bell icon. And don't forget to share this video with your friends. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. Now, Jeremy, thank you for coming on the show. And thank you for having we me. We appreciate that. Yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah. Thank, thanks so much, Jeremy. Until next time.